Good Wednesday morning to everyone. It's great to see some smiling faces and some, oh, some foggy faces too, those people that just got up and are trying to wake up. And But I see there's some people that are in their offices, Mike Black, and so they're uh, already working away and been working for a while. So that's, uh, that's a good thing as well. Going to be a nice sunny day today. That's kind of great because everybody kind of knows Wednesdays is my golf day. So uh, sometime this afternoon, I'll try and head over to the links if I possibly can get out of here and uh, and get some sun and some play time in. We're going to have some rain tomorrow. Don't worry. Uh, the weekend's coming. Going to be sunny on Friday and sunny on Saturday and Sunday probably too. So uh, a great uh, weekend ahead. Um, also some good news about... Um, uh, the pandemic situation, I think people have been following, cases are down. Um, the reality is, I think, um, and we probably should have been doing this from the very beginning, I wish we had been concentrating on the numbers in the hospital because, you know, the reality of it is that's the key. The key is not the number of cases, the key is the number of people in hospital and the number of people in ICUs, and I, I think that's the number we should be concentrating on because oftentimes we would get, I would get comments, well, there weren't very many cases today, but you know, if hospitals are still inundated, people are still uh, struggling in ICU and we're still getting deaths, there's still a problem. So uh, we do have uh, the opportunity now to correct this by vaccinations. Um, and I think many people are taking advantage of that. It's a good sign that they are. Um, we are encouraging the, uh, the governments, both provincially and federally, to look at some sort of certification. Um, we think that um, it's, um, there are a number of businesses that have approached us and talked to us about some concerns. Um, in fact, uh, what's interesting is uh, there are a number of businesses who are operating at less than the capacity that they're entitled to um, under the um, step three. And the only reason they're operating at less than that is because of their own level of confidence. Uh, they want to make sure that they're uh, not going to be a super spreader event or place. And uh, I think that's pretty responsible in spite of the fact they'd love to have more people. Uh, they are taking the responsibility to make sure uh, that they're doing the right thing. So we would like to see, uh, you know, the uh, obviously the restrictions reduced and more openness, but we want to, uh, of course, use the precautionary principle. It's interesting. The other day, Dr. Tam came out and said, uh, if you're double vaccinated, you do not need to wear a mask. Um, and last night, I think it was the CDC came out and said, uh, with the rapid spread and ease of spread of the Delta variant, um, even if you're double vaccinated, you can still spread it. There is no credible science that says uh, you cannot carry and spread um, uh, the virus, uh, even if you are double vaccinated. So, um, you know, as long as there's a, a percentage of the population, a fairly deep percentage of the population that uh, is unvaccinated, um, we want to make sure our hospitals don't get inundated um, so that other surgeries and other treatments can continue uh, as well, because it's important that we get back to uh, basically caring for all health care issues uh, in the province. Anyway, that's my kind of rant and talk this morning. We're just going to go right into something that's on everybody's mind and that's uh, taxes and concerns. And I think it's probably appropriate to uh, talk about um, property taxes um, because that's, you know, I think federal and provincial governments really have it easy when it comes, when you start comparing levels of government, they have it really easy. Uh, they can mount debt uh, against anything. Um, they, it doesn't have to be a capital project. It can just be, oh, we overspent. So we'll just, we'll just call that as debt and we'll accumulate our debt. Municipal governments are in, unable to do that. They can uh, certainly uh, acquire debt, but only for capital expenditures. And uh, that causes uh, uh, oftentimes um, a number of budgeting problems. So the Ontario Chamber of Commerce came out with a brief um, last uh, week called uh, Bolstering the Fiscal Resilience of Ontario Municipalities. 
and it's titled Better Budgets. And uh, it's really calling for a number of actions, actually 14. And um, David Calder, our uh, city manager, who's always uh, answers yes to me when I send him an email. I have no idea why, um, other than the fact that we, I've probably known him for far too long for him to say no to me about anything. But, uh, and then he brought Cheryl Ayers, his CFO, the person that actually, um, <laughs> The, the bag person, right? The person that's got all the cash and all of the department managers and the city manager are always trying to get their fingers in that pot and politicians are trying to get their fingers in that pot. And Cheryl Ayers is the CFO and her job is to pull the drawstrings on the bag as quick as she can when somebody's hands are in there inappropriately and make sure that, uh, that uh, the city of Cambridge adheres to the responsibilities they have uh, under the um, uh, Municipal Act. And so thanks, David and Cheryl, for coming this morning. Thank you, Greg. I guess, yeah, I must be a glutton for punishment because I keep saying yes to you. But anyway, <laughs> it's uh, great to be here and thanks for the invitation. So good morning to all the members of, of the uh, Chamber of Commerce. I know we have some guests from council. We had a late council meeting last night, so good to see you so early this morning. Um, but Greg, I just really wanted to start off by saying that I, I commend the Ontario Chamber of Commerce for their work on better budgets. I think um, you know they're advocating on behalf of municipalities in a way for some of the recommendations that are contained in that report. Because I think as I said to you earlier, um, there's some old chestnuts in here. Once, you know, things that we've been trying to get uh, change for um, over many, many years. And there's some new um, initiatives here too. So, so it's a good variety. And I think, um, you know, as I look through it, um, there's some we support as a municipality probably, some might not be as supportable. And then there's others that I think, you know, we can fine tune a little bit to sort of understand exactly what the position of the Ontario Chamber is on this. So, so I look forward to our discussion today. Yeah. And I did bring Cheryl along because, you know, I'm sort of the broad, based person to look at the big picture, whereas you say Cheryl gets down into the granular part and, and keeps our finances under control and slaps the hands away when required. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, we talked about uh, particularly um, some reserve funds and things like that. And I think Cheryl, you know, wants to talk a little bit about and caution about reserve funds because they're there for a reason. It's not a slush fund. Um, they have a specific use and, and we have to protect them. So anyway, um, I do look forward to the discussion. So, so thanks right. for having us. And We're going to take a little bit as you, as yeah. you sort of go through, I think the recommendations. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, and I know Cheryl won't be uh, too shy to jump in when you're wrong, David. Um, uh, and, and, and that's a good thing because Cheryl's the expert uh, from that perspective. So, and Cheryl, thank you for coming. Uh, this is the first time we've had you on Chamber Chat. I know you've been on before uh, to watch, uh, but uh, thank you very much for coming this morning as well. You're welcome. I appreciate you asking me. Thank you. Um, you know, the, uh, the Ontario government... Um, uh, is is what a lot of people don't understand is is province or municipalities are creatures of the province. So we're we're there. Municipalities are there, basically at the at the purview of the province of Ontario. Um, you know, we're other than the city of Toronto, which has its own act. Um, you know, municipalities are kind of guided and steered and regulated and dictated to by their, their provincial uh, body. And I think it, it poses a number of problems because if you wanna make changes um, in tax policy or tax legislation or even planning uh, policies or planning legislation, um, a lot of that has to go to the province. You have to get kind of the blessing and, and, uh, and those changes can be made. One of the things that the Canadian Chamber has called for on a national perspective is to get a royal commission on reviewing the tax policy. There's a lot of people on this call right now who weren't even born the last time the federal tax policy was reviewed. Um, it's an old, old document started off with about, I don't know, uh, 18 pages. It's now over 3000 pages. Um, 
it's uh, there, there has never been any significant changes other than additions to or modifications to original legislation. So you could probably assume that once that happens and you go down the path for years and years and years of just adding little tidbits and little, little issues that at some point you're gonna to have to have that full review and consolidate things and make things a little bit more sensible. Um, so I, the, on, the uh, Ontario Chamber of Commerce is calling on, and I don't know whether, Cheryl, maybe you can, because I know you're, you're familiar with this document. The Ontario uh, Chamber is suggesting that the Ontario government should undertake a comprehensive and forward-looking review of Ontario's property tax system. Would it take that same, I know it's not the entire tax system, it's a property tax system. Would it take that same kind of level of adjudication uh, for lack of a better word um, that it would at a, as a Royal Commission? Would it be a type of Royal Commission at a provincial level? That's a good question, Greg. Um, I'm not sure about that. I do agree with the recommendation from the chamber though that uh, review of the property tax system is needed. As you mentioned, it is quite dated. I know the current system that's in place has been in place since the 90s. So um, I think a review of the system would be a fair and a relevant recommendation. But in doing that, I think they also need to look at other revenue tools that municipalities can use in addition to property taxes. And I know there is a task force that I was on probably about 10 years ago of a bunch of municipalities that were considering what some of those um, other revenue tools should be and trying to make recommendations to the province. And it never really went anywhere, but I think there, it, there's a whole package that needs to be looked at in terms of revenue tools that include property taxes, but also other things. And an example of that might be the municipal accommodation tax that's been put in place to help municipalities. So I believe there's other ways that we can raise revenue besides property taxation. And I think that needs to be looked at comprehensively in terms of a review and also looking at the total structure of taxes across Canada. Um, if you think about it, the federal government and provincial government get almost 91% of the taxes, tax dollars from all residents in Canada and municipalities only receive about 9% of the total tax dollars yet we have the greatest portion of expenses related to the assets that we own. And we are closer to the people in terms of the local services we provide. So I believe there needs to be a comprehensive review of the whole tax system and how it's allocated amongst the three levels of government and ensuring there's transparency and equity in how funds are raised from the residents in Canada. Yeah, you know, it's it's really it's really interesting. We've had a number of discussions. I can recall probably thirty years of discussions around you know the restrictiveness of of uh, municipalities' ability to raise revenues, and that you know there's you know we 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 can even have discussions about you know the appropriateness of 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 some services being on the backs of the property taxpayer as opposed to another form of tax. And I think at some point, you know, we, ha we have to, you know, undo the system, so to speak, and make sure that uh, taxes are applied uh, appropriately. And uh, I, think, I think, David, if you remember back in the uh, Harris days when there was, you know, the, what was it, the who does what panels were started and you know there were transfers of responsibilities and I, I remember the the famous saying was everything's revenue neutral right so so the <laughs> the the responsibility uh, being sent down or moved up whatever the case may be and the money followed it and but that wasn't necessarily the case and it it, it may be in some areas uh, through an imbalance into the system where you know, there really are, are some services or some um, levels of, of service that are on the backs of property taxpayers when they probably shouldn't be. They should be other forms of taxation. No, I, I think that's very true. And I think the document that the Ontario Chamber has, has created talks about some of that in terms of 
you know, the who does what, it is almost going back to that thing. It was in the Harris days about, you know, who does what, and then the downloading, as we said, um, um, coming to the municipal property taxpayer, as opposed to um, social services being paid through um, income tax and other tax uh, forms. The other piece for me is that, you know, the document also talks about, you know, we need to review who um, should be providing what services and, and whether there is really more ways to be cost efficient in the supply of those services, whether it's at the provincial or municipal level. So I was quite intrigued with, with the chamber's uh, position on that to, to have that conversation. It's a very complex conversation, but I think it's one that you know, needs to take place. Um, it, it's, it's interesting to note too, that I think um, one of the things they, they want to talk about is, you know, that pay for say um, that we often hear about. It, it doesn't necessarily always happen. Sometimes there's some funds that come with, with a service that we're being asked to deliver, other times not so much, or it's only a portion. Um, so, so there's lots of inconsistencies in, in some of these service deliveries. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sort of a believer of, you know, property tax originally was to pay for services that come to the property. Um, but, you know, as you know, over the years, those services have expanded greatly. <laughs> I can remember actually back in those days being at a golf tournament and the, uh, Premier Harris was there and, and uh, Jane was actually there. She was the mayor at the time and there was kind of a group of us standing around and and uh, he made some comment about, it was budget time for us, uh, at, or, or approaching budget time. He says, well, you know, how have things, uh, 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 how are things going with the budgeting with all of the changes and, and uh, that have come forward? And I said to him, I said, I, I think what you're doing is fantastic. If you, uh, we'll get out of your pockets as soon as you get out of our faces. And, and basically that's the, the, the pay for, say uh, kind of formula you know if you want to have um, you know my my comment to him was if if the province wants to have a say in how we deliver the services at the local level um, or legislate how it's it's done then you, that needs to come with some uh, ability for us to fund that if if not if you're leaving it to us uh, to find that out and giving us the tools uh, to be able to generate the revenue to provide that service, then 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 that's fine. But um, you, you you can't have it both ways. You can't have the say and not have the pay. And I think that's where where I think I think that was his intent in the very beginning. I, you know, I, the waters always get muddy when when it starts to become political um, uh, along the way. And so you know. Um, it, it, it probably didn't end up to be um, as good as everyone thought it would be. I think if, if they'd have been maybe a little bit more bolder um, and listened a little bit more to municipalities, it might've worked out. There, there's right. also just one on that, if I could, just yeah. on that, I wanted to, you know, off the top, you, you talked about municipalities being creatures of the province. Well, I think that that's partly true, but municipalities, you know, I'd say over my last 20 years or so, they've been actually looking for more autonomy to be, you know, what the province says, you know, we are a responsible form of government. Okay, prove it. Let us be autonomous in, in areas where we can decide the level of the service, the type of service, those sorts of things. And I think, you know, Amos been big on that over the years, the Association of Municipalities of Ontario. And that's, I noticed there's a bit of a contradiction in the Ontario Chamber's document in terms of sort of wanting more provincial control over certain things, yet on the other hand, we're trying to have more autonomy so that we can make better local decisions and councils can make better local decisions. So I think we've got to, you know, sort of figure out, okay, where do, where do we want to be in that spectrum? Um, so, so I think there's, there needs to be discussion around uh, you know, trying to make sure that we can control our destiny a little bit um, where appropriate. So I just yeah. wanted to say that. Uh, there, there's another uh, recommendation that says the government of Ontario should extend the postponement of property tax assessments until a more equitable and efficient property tax re regime can be established. That, you know, I guess in theory, uh, you know, yeah, that kind of makes sense. If you're going to review the system, let's put a hold on everything and let's review the system. The problem is if you take 
on a national perspective, a royal commission could take years. Um, uh, it probably would be an awful lot shorter, you know, reviewing the property tax system, but it still could take quite a length of time to, to make sure that it's all done and gotten right. When I first got elected back in 1991, I got elected right in the very heart of a tax revolt thing that was going on. Actually, I don't know what I was thinking. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure I, I was really aware that there was a big tax revolt going on at the time I ran. Um, but, you know, it was interesting. It was all about uh, property tax. And, and really what, what I kind of found was that at that point, the reassessment programs uh, that were going on were, you know, very sporadic. And I think the that it had been at least five years, quite possibly even longer than five years, that property uh, property values had been reassessed at the time. And so what happens is, and, and this was the hard thing to explain to people, is the pot of money, the millions of dollars that the, the city budgets, didn't change. It didn't go up. Um, there wasn't more money coming into the city it was that there was a shift of where the tax was applied to based on the value of the properties that were reassessed. So some properties uh, during that time actually had a reduction in taxes. And there were other properties that had a dramatic increase in taxes because the value of properties shifted and that, you know, moved the, the waters a, a little bit. It was very difficult to explain at that point. But but I think my concern with this recommendation a little bit is, um, is that if it takes a long, long time to review the property tax situation and then you, know, you just come back, well, everything's gotta be reassessed at that point, you've got such a big gap, there's gonna be huge shifts and you're, you're, you're just gonna create the same problem that we had you know, back in the 90s with this massive shift where you know, some people's um, property, property taxes actually doubled back then. Uh, because uh, reassessment hadn't happened uh, quickly enough. Cheryl, you're, you're right in tune with all of that because you understand where the money comes from and, and how it's proportioned and divided up. Um, does that give you concern about extending out and not reassessing properties rapidly enough? Like ideally, maybe for argument's sake, it might be great to have them reassessed every year or two as opposed to spreading it out four or five years in between reassessments. Yeah, I completely agree, Greg. Um, currently, the property assessment values that we use for taxation are based on 2016 values. So they're already five years out of date. Um, so that is a concern if we were to postpone it even further. As you mentioned, there are great inequities um, in property values over that length of time. And I think a common misconception that people often don't realize is that, as we've seen recently, real estate values have increased significantly. That is across the board, so that doesn't affect property taxes because everybody's property is increasing at that higher rate. So that wouldn't necessarily cause an issue if there was a postponement. The real issue is more in terms of the changes within the, the fabric of the community or the province. Um, as some areas are developing faster than others, that will increase property values or change, as you mentioned, the shift in property values. So it's very common to see some property values decrease while others are increasing and that inequity then does cause a problem. So um, I feel strongly that four years or even going beyond that is too long to wait for um, property assessment, especially in communities where there's a lot of growth and development happening because there are changes in pockets of the community that shift that assessment value um, in the community. So yeah, I agree with you that it should be done more often and a postponement would only further exacerbate the problem, so. Yeah, yeah, and I think that it's hard enough to explain how the system works. Um, to people. And then, you know, all of a sudden you get these crazy, wacky adjustments and, well, you know, you're lost right out of the gate because, you know, and I fully understand it. You know, my taxes go up dramatically. I obviously, I'm not going to be too happy about it. Um, and so there, you know, in, in a lot of people's mind, there is no explanation for it. But the explanation is really, really clear. If, 
if you use the value of say a million dollars, if the property tax, uh, the requirements for the city is a million dollars and there's a property tax reassessment and your taxes go up and person across the, the city goes down, the million dollars doesn't change. There's no more money going into the municipal hands. It's the same million dollars. It's just proportioned differently throughout the community or throughout the taxpayer. So, you know, I think at that time, I can remember, uh, you know, having people think they thought, oh, the city was just, you know, jacking up taxes. Mm -hmm. they, they were not. They, in fact, I think the city didn't even have any responsibility for it at the time. It was just property tax reassessment and it just happens and, and, and that's how it gets distributed. So I think, and Greg, I think one of the recommendations, again, is, you know, to eliminate the non-residential tax. And yeah. that's exactly what would happen. It would have to be redistributed to those other tax categories or tax classes yeah. being mostly residential. So yeah, yeah there'd be savings I, for one group, but increase for another. And I remember, I remember uh, that, that actually Harris had started down that path. And I think when Dalton McGinty was elected, he put a stop to it because the transition had already started or was about to start in municipalities across the province. And, you know, at that time, you know, I had my own business in, in Preston and I'm thinking, well, wait a minute here. If you're going to shift the property tax away from my business, of which I get a tax credit for, it's, an, it's a business expense. I don't have to take it as personal income and pay income taxes on it and then pay it out. If you're going to shift that from my business to my personal property, now I have to take more money out of my business in order to pay my increased property taxes. And I got to pay tax on that. Where from the business's perspective, it, it, it's actually a business expense. That's not saying that there isn't discrepancies, I believe in, in how businesses are charged. It's just, you know, when you start to make that shift, you have to realize um, that uh, moving it from your business to your home um, it is not necessarily a tax advantage for you in the end from a from an income tax perspective because you're going to have to make up for that down the road. So there are there are problems with that. And when you remove the non-residential uh, property taxes off of businesses without finding a way to recover that revenue, then that money has to be shifted onto the residential property taxes, and you'll see some pretty massive increases there. Um, the, the um, let's see here. Greg, I wonder, um, one of the items was in a sort of on the same basis, but I think, you know, it uh, is an issue that might relate to your members. And that was um, the government of Ontario should reconsider the use of highest and best use yeah. approach to property tax assessment. I just wanted Cheryl to explain, we think that's a little misleading um, in terms of what it's assuming. Um, as a statement. So Cheryl, do you mind just talking about that? Sure. Um, I, I agree, it is misleading. And I actually had a call with MPAC this morning just to um, clarify and, and talk to them about that statement. So, um, and they would be open to speaking with the chamber as well and helping to clarify that misunderstanding. But um, when MPAC is doing assessment of properties, they do it based on a process called current value assessment or CBA, not um, the highest and best use. That is uh, an appraisal principle that is used in appraising properties, but it's not a practice that's used by MPAC. So there was an example in the report about a parking lot that's being assessed as commercial and it's next to a commercial office tower and how that property would be um, assessed based on its highest and best use of um, having a commercial property or a commercial office tower on that property as well. And that's how the taxes are um, calculated for that property. That is not correct. There is a tax code that we use for parking lots. So that property is based on um, the zoning, which is commercial and then it's applied a, a different tax rate than what a commercial office tower would be. So that is a common misconception that um, 
people believe that MPAC is using this principle of highest and best use, but they actually are using this current value assessment as their approach for how they assess properties. And it's based on what the current value and current use of the property is, not the highest and best use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think uh, part of the issue around that is, and uh, I see Hardy is on too, but and could probably explain a lot better than I could. But um, but your 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 municipalities are regulated with the number of different types of zoning uh, applications they can have, or or types that they can have. And so once you fill up that capacity, then you have to create other components uh, to assist that. And, and it would be that exact scenario where you've got a parking lot that's in a commercially designated uh, uh, zoning, uh, but you give a credit because it's not a six-story tower, office tower. Um, so it doesn't have the value that it would as an operating commercial function. So you, you basically apply a credit. It's the bad... Uh, um, um, maybe explanation of it, but you know, we I know that from a personal perspective, where um, we have a cottage and and uh, and and they can't they can't have a defined because there's not very many cottages. They they don't put a certain uh, 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 zoning in there for the cottage. They they zone it as a residential, but then because it's seasonally considered, there's a there's a reduction in the rate because of it being seasonal. So. You know, it's it's the way municipalities do without having a million different zones because they you you know you, you just can't deal with that if if you've got all kinds of different uh, levels of zoning. So um, maybe a bad explanation, but uh, if Hardy just nods his head yes or no, was I close on that? You know, yeah. <laughs> see, uh, it's not bad. See, I for, I remember a lot of things from the 1990s, Hardy. Um, um, there, there was some talk here too about municipal governments should review their existing catalog of user fees, permits, licenses, and fines. Consider how it can be adjusted to reflect changes in demand. I'm not quite sure what they're, what they're driving at there, whether they're saying the user fees are too high or maybe too low. And, you know, where you've got, you know, maybe your arenas are full uh, to capacity, you just keep upping the price kind of like you would do in the private sector. You know, as long as the demand's there, you just keep raising the price. I'm not sure, um, Cheryl, did you, have you deep dived into what they actually mean by that? Well, I was assuming they were thinking that we should be increasing our other um, opportunities to collect fees so that it reduces the amount of taxation that we would um, levy across the community. But maybe I was not assuming correctly. Um, this is an area though that I, I have a lot of passion for and I'm actually writing a research paper right now on this. And what is that optimal balance of um, revenues that municipalities should be collecting from user fees and permits and licenses versus taxation? And there's a lot of different theories on it. Um, personally, I feel like we should be charging um, for services where there is a direct benefit to a person who's consuming that service. So in the example of um, arenas or facilities or programs that we offer to the community, if we can charge that directly to the person using it, um, there are benefits to that as it decreases the property taxation, but then you need to look broader beyond that and consider a broader community benefit in providing those services as well, because it creates a, a better community where people have opportunities to learn and play and stay out of trouble. Um, so I, it's an area that I feel strongly about and I'm, I've been doing a lot of research and work on this lately in terms of what is that right balance between those fees that municipalities could collect versus property taxation and then looking at the social component and the social aspects of that in how, how it benefits the community as well. Yeah, I, you know, I, and I think there's 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 some areas where um, you know, especially when you talk about arenas and parks and and those kinds of services, I think where you know you have to be 
you have to be really cognizant on the fact that there, you know, are different levels of ability to pay um, uh, from people in the community, and you want to make it accessible to everybody in the community. So how do you how do you balance that with um, um, with with all of the other um, you know needs that the municipality has? I'm wondering if they were you know more targeting in on you know. Um, you know, development charges and other fees and, and uh, you know, planning fees or building permit fees and things like that, that oftentimes, if you talk to the development world, they'll say they're quite, they're, they're high enough, you know, they're, they're, they're suitable, um, leave them alone. So, but, you know, it, it might be um, a way to, uh, you know, reflect back and see what's appropriate and what makes sense. And I'm glad to hear you're writing a research paper on it. Um, because that might be something that um, uh, that would be beneficial for the Ontario Chamber to to have a look at too the value of of uh, of some of these services that are that are in our communities. Um, right. Just to add to that too, I just wanted to point out that uh, council has directed uh, staff to actually do a fair a comprehensive review of our user fees. Um, you know, the other piece to user fees is we want to be competitive and uh, with our surrounding municipalities as well to make sure there's equity in, in the services that we all provide within the region. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're, we're taking a, a closer look uh, to make sure, you know, we're in the right place in terms of fees. The other piece is, you know, right now it's a blend, like you said, um, we're subsidizing some user fees with both, you know, pay for, for play plus um, you know, off the tax base to subsidize as well. So yeah. there's lots of things that municipalities do that, you know, don't really make good business sense in terms of, yeah. of, of profit or, or even uh, cost recovery. So I think there's a whole scheme there in terms of, of the user fees that needs to be really examined more closely. And I think, yeah, yeah the, share, the work Cheryl's doing will certainly shed some light on that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I wasn't quite sure what, what the chamber was getting at, yeah. um, but that's often been a complaint. You know, I pay my taxes and then you're charging me over here too. So yeah, yeah what do well, I do? And then, right? and, then, and then you say, well, I pay my taxes and I don't have a kid that goes into the arena. You know, like I've, I've heard, the, I heard that story many, many times as well. And, you know, but I think as Cheryl kind of alluded to, you, you're, you're trying to create community here and, and, and that's, part of the community as well, I think, um, you know, it's interesting. And as I mentioned, it's finding that balance. What is the yeah. right amount that should be subsidized to create a good community versus how much should people be paying directly? And part of that comprehensive user fee review that David mentioned we're working on right now, we'll be looking at policy similar to on the tax side, we have tax policy. Um, I want to put more policies in place in terms of the recovery of our costs through the fees that we charge, and then that'll provide a better structure in the future for how we charge our fees. Mm -hmm. The municipal accommodation tax is really, 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 really interesting. I think I, for the life of me, um, I have I have no understanding why it's taken so long to get implemented into the region of Waterloo. Um, uh, you know, I travel a, a lot, um, or did before the pandemic, and thankfully I'm not traveling too much now, um, nor, nor, nor do I plan in the future too much, but, uh, but you know, I, I, paid, I paid that extra tax, you know, for years, and that extra tax, you know, I'm a visitor to the community, I'm paying nothing, I'm using all of the services of the community while I'm there, um, and I'm paying nothing, contributing nothing to it. Um, I, you know, I, I would look at it and say, well, yeah, so what? You know, it's five bucks, eight bucks, six bucks. Who, who really cares? It didn't really bother me that much. Um, and, and it's really important to the municipalities that are delivering the services. Uh, visitors come into the community. You know, we're expending municipal resources on, on you know, accommodating them while they're here. Um, there should be a proportion coming back to help us um, uh, deal with some of the expenses around bringing them here. And uh, I think it's only appropriate, but um, there, I, I'm not even sure whether, you know, enforceable rules clarify how municipalities may use municipal um, uh, uh, accommodation taxes. 
my understanding was you had to develop that policy before you could even implement it. I think there was rules and regulations at the province that said you needed to define what you're going to use it for and how you're going to use it. And it would only be allowed to be applied if it was going to be appropriately used. Is that, am I wrong with that, David? Or No, is that no, you're, you're correct. And um, the MAT tax came into being in, I think, around 2019, um, just shortly ahead of the, the pandemic. Um, Perfect so timing. Yeah, so it is in place um, and it is very defined. 50% of it is used for, for tourism marketing. 40% is used by the municipality, but again, for specific uh, sports or tourism, you know, attraction, events, those sorts of things. And then 10% goes to the region as well for similar um, activities. So it's not going into the general coffers of the municipality. That there's a bylaw that authorizes the MAT tax and it's very specific as to what it can be spent on. And if somebody's interested, we can follow up with them later. There's a list of things that, that it can be used for. And I think the important thing for Cambridge is, well, there's two things. One is, you know, we have the most beds for accommodation within the city of Cambridge. Um, so it, it should eventually generate some good revenue to increase tourism and marketing. The difficulty has been that the pandemic hit and you know those accommodations and I think you've got some members on that are in the hospitality industry and the and the motel hotel, you know, their numbers drop significantly. So the collection of the tax has not met its its financial targets. And I'm sure Cheryl has specifics on numbers, but um, you know, it, it hasn't generated quite the revenue we thought it would yet. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, that's where we're at. And uh, you know, we, um, the Waterloo uh, Tourism and Marketing Corporation uh, looks after spending about 50% of it. So that's, that's where that is. So mm -hmm. Cheryl, is there anything else you wanted to add to that? No, I think you've summed it up well, David, and um, you are correct. correct. It is unfortunate timing of when we implemented it because we haven't been um, able to effectively collect the revenue that we had anticipated um, so far it's been almost two years that that's been in place and we've only collected about one year's worth of revenue essentially. Um, but yeah, there is a bylaw in place in the city of Cambridge that explains or um, lays out what that funding can be used towards. And it's all tourism and event related type of activities that are going to draw people to the community, which then, um, helps the businesses in the community by bringing tourists and visitors to the area and spending their dollars here while, while they're here mm -hmm. to visit. So. Yeah. so Greg, we think the controls are there now. So I'm not mm -hmm. sure what more the change. Yeah, I, 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 unless there are, but my understanding was in going through the whole process was, you know, the province has to approve everything that you do when it comes to taxation, um, uh, especially this type of taxation. And uh, my understanding where there were rules and regulations around. So may maybe there's other rules and regulations that they're talking about that they want to, uh, they want to, uh, you know, present. The, the one thing I want to really get to that's um, I I always been a little bit of a, of a craw for me is we have a, a infrastructure defici deficiency, um, you know, that mounts across the country. It's enormous. Um, and that basically is, you know, a, in large part, a lot of the stuff that we don't see, we drive over or walk over um, every single day. The the sewer and water systems that are that are uh, you know uh, taking away our waste and giving us the fresh water um, and clean water that we need uh, to survive with, and and those deficiencies are just getting bigger, not smaller. Um, and a lot of it is to do with municipalities' uh, difficulty in being able to address or, or keep up with um, uh, the replacement programs with it. Part of the problem is um, that, you know, the only real source of revenue, beside user fees and those kinds of things and permit fees, has been the property tax. And so, you know, is it fair to burden the property tax. Well, we couldn't, well, the reality of it is folks, we, we couldn't afford um, uh, our property taxes if we, you know, had to burden the property taxes right away with, with all of these additional expenses. And the problem is we're, you know, we're, we're losing traction and we're losing ground. 
I think there was some ground made up back in the, the uh, Harper days when the federal government was finally convinced by FCM to share some of the gas tax revenue uh, that was coming in with municipalities. And, you know, there was a little bit of a bump up for, for municipalities, but th there's also regulatory controls on how municipalities can get their revenue. Um, and, um, and, you know, I've long been an advocate of, you know, the federal and provincial levels of government need to sit down with municipal leaders and find ways um, where um, there are better uh, mechanisms for revenue generation in, the, in municipalities so that they can accommodate these deficiencies. I, I, as I said, spent a lot of time traveling around prior to the pandemic. And oftentimes I would be in meetings, you know, in Dallas, Texas, or just outside of Dallas with the mayor. And I'd ask the mayor, you know, how do they, you know, how does their tax system work? And, you know, because I was just kind of interested in it. I want to tell you, um, you know, there are really better, better ways of, of uh, being able to use the property tax system appropriately um, and use the sales tax system more appropriately to, to generate needs and, and interests at the local level. So I, I guess, you know, what I want to do is maybe, and maybe this is more David's, but, but also Cheryl, you would be well-versed on what you know, what revenue opportunities should be or could be available to municipalities. So both of you should probably comment, how can we do a better job of funding municipalities so that we don't lose traction like we are with infrastructure deficits? So Greg, you mentioned gas tax. So that's one that we were appreciative that that has come into effect. Um, it's still a small percentage in terms of dollars and is reliant on um, consumption of fuel, right, and other things like that in terms of what we get. Um, I think the sales tax has been one that's been discussed over the years, whether there could be a municipal sales tax or not. Um, again, that's, that's another one. I think Cheryl can talk about whether there should be a capital levy, uh, meaning a separate uh, tax collected for capital works, because as you noted, um, we have been on the forefront of asset management, but we know we have a uh, funding gap, meaning our aging infrastructure continues to age, right? And we're trying to replace it, uh, but the, the revenue we generate, I, I think what Cheryl, I'll throw out a number and you can correct me, it's, it's around you know, a 60 to $90 million deficit in our, our assets and uh, in terms of replacement. So you're seeing in the city of Cambridge over the next couple of years with the support of council that we are looking at uh, improving and replacing some uh, very important um, recreational uh, uh, facilities. We're looking at our aging um, underground infrastructures in our older neighborhoods, you know, that are, you know, aged that, you know, 50 years plus. Um, we're running to failure on some facilities even and, and some assets, meaning we, we're just almost waiting for them to, to break down. So it's a real issue um, that council is well aware of uh, in terms of what the deficit is because we report that to them. We're funding as much as we can uh, to replace you know, high priority, uh, but it's a struggle. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Cheryl if she has other things to add in terms of where we can get additional revenues. But I'm always very conscientious too that there's really one taxpayer. So there's all these other funding things, but it's still coming from the same same pocket mm -hmm. basically. So anyway, Cheryl. Yeah, you raised a lot of good points, David. And um, one thing I want to expand on is in terms of the capital levy, a lot of municipalities are implementing capital levies in order to address their infrastructure deficits. And the theory around that is that the residents in the community today are using those assets. So by paying that capital levy, the money goes into a reserve to fund the future rehabilitation of those assets. So it's basically you're paying for it now to replace it in the future. So a lot of municipalities have implemented uh, a capital levy in order to address that infrastructure deficit. Um, a couple other things that I've considered is if the province should be sharing some of the revenue they receive from vehicle registrations. 
So those vehicles, when you renew your license every year, those vehicles are driving on the local municipal roads predominantly. So should a share of that revenue be coming to the municipalities to fund the rehabilitation of roads? Or another option is possibly the land transfer tax that you pay on um, property transactions. And should a portion of that be coming to the municipality as well? So those properties and the people moving into those properties or the businesses are using municipal services, but municipalities are not receiving any of the revenue related to that tax either. So those are a couple of the, the revenue tools that I mentioned earlier that um, municipalities have been discussing and um, considering whether how we approach the province and lobby for a share of that revenue, similar to what we've received through the federal gas tax revenue. But when you consider municipalities own approximately 67% of the assets and the province owns 22 and the federal government owns 10%, um, municipalities should be receiving a greater share of that revenue from those taxes in order to rehabilitate the assets in the future and address that gap that exists. Yeah, I, you know, of course, I like, I'm, I, you know, I favor municipal governments um, only because they're closer to us. They're, they're, you know, more convenient there. You can talk to them. Um, you know, it's very, very difficult to get the big uh, wheel of uh, provincial or federal governments working in your direction where it's relatively easy to get municipal governments working in, in you know, in concert with the community as well. And I think there's got to be, um, there's, there's got to be a real open and honest discussion on the appropriateness of where revenues come from and what we're saddling on the backs of property taxpayers as opposed to uh, other areas. I, th I, th I think it's a, it's a really broad um, uh, discussion that needs to take place. When I was, you know, uh, at a meeting in the U.S., um, I actually was sitting beside the mayor um, of, uh, of uh, can't remember the name of the municipality now, it was just outside of Dallas, but, you know, and I asked him about, um, he had only been just recently elected, I guess. And, and uh, I asked him about the budgeting format and, and property tax and why are their property taxes so much lower than ours? And, and the reality of it was their property taxes are really defined to pay for those broad services, yeah. police, fire, you know, those kinds of services that are essential to, you know, having the health and safety basically aspects of a municipality operate. And that, um, that the municipality had the ability up to a certain point um, to add a sales tax component in for their area. And, and, and you know, don't be afraid. It wasn't, wasn't huge. It was like, you know, 1.4% or 1.4 cents or something like that on every dollar spent. But that created billions of dollars of revenue for the municipality to spend on, you know, parks and stadiums and arenas and and actually they were they were putting up a 1.9 billion dollar uh, uh, elevated uh, monorail system. You know, like that's where the revenue came from, and it was appropriate because that was the development of the city, and it was the sales, and it was the revenue coming into the city and the expenditures. And, and it seemed to me actually on the surface in a very short conversation, but that um, you know, municipal property taxes should be paying for those essential items and we should be looking for other avenues uh, of revenue to pay for all of the needs and wants and that uh, everybody wants to make their community wonderful. But um, we, we'll probably never win that battle in my lifetime anyway, but. I want to get to a couple of questions that are here. There's one about reserve funds. I don't know whether you've seen that, Cheryl. If reserve funds are not slush funds, is there a clear statement of purpose to the reserve funds and limits on disbursements from re reserved property? Not sure what reserve property taxes means, but uh, so there are there are defined rules around the the uh, the reserve funds. Yes, council has approved a reserve and reserve fund bylaw that states what the um, acceptable uses of each reserve and reserve fund is. Um, there's also legislated reserve funds such as the development charges that can only be used for specific purposes. So it, they're not slush funds. 
um, they can't be used for just anything that the municipality decides they want to spend on. Um, there are clear rules about the use of each of the reserve and reserve funds. Uh, the revenue comes from specific sources and it's put away to address specific needs in the future. And a lot of people believe that municipalities shouldn't have um, reserves because they feel that we are taxing for that and putting money away. Whereas I believe that in order to do prudent financial planning, we need to make sure that we have funds set away in reserves so that we can plan for the future expenditures and address things like that infrastructure deficit, similar to what we do in our personal finances. You put money away because you know you need to do um, improvements on your house in the future or buy a new car. So it's prudent to be putting money away into reserve and reserve funds, making sure that they have a designated purpose attached to them so that they're not just used as a slush fund. Um, so the, as I say, the city does have a bylaw in place that controls that. I, th I think the last part of the question might be more related to the uh, rate stabilization fund that's uh, out of, you know, largely uh, generated through um, surpluses at the end of the year and that kind of thing. And, and but there are, uh, there's probably not necessarily limits on disbursements, but there's advice given to council. They could deplete the fund, I'm sure, if they wanted to, to offset property tax increases. But there's also wise uh, uh, counsel to uh, uh, counsel of the data to to make sure that uh, that there's some for next year because you never know what next year is going to hold. Is, it, is that correct? Well, and you're right, Greg. As, Stop. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, Cheryl. So I was just going to say, as you mentioned, municipalities can't run a deficit, so that tax stabilization reserve fund helps to offset. Sometimes we, well, if, like this past year, we ran into a pandemic and incurred a bunch of expenses that we weren't planning on in our budget. We lost a lot of revenue that we weren't expecting due to closing facilities. So having that reserve in place to fund those types of unforeseen events is again, good financial planning and good financial management of the city. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, when I, when I look back on uh, my tenure there, I think, you know, one of the, one of the maybe, yeah, I'm going to say one of the mistakes we we made as council because I'm I'm always saying I made huge mistakes when I was on council, but but one of the one of the bigger mistakes that I made while I was on council was 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 probably and and I'm not even sure whether David would probably look it up, but uh, I'm not sure that I was in support of it. But when we went to a zero debt, so you know, I was actually put in charge of chairing um, uh, the debt um, uh, debt load task force at the time and you know we had come up with well the city should you know uh, appropriately go into uh, or or get um about five million dollars a year of capital debt was kind of our limit at that time our benchmark at that time um and then you know at the same time we were doing zero 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 the council decided wisely that they would go to no debt um and we'd pay as we go and and uh and I think, you know, the problem is that when you look around, we were probably one of the only municipalities in the province at the time that went to zero debt, other than North Dumfries, they never had any debt forever, but, and never increased taxes. We, we don't know how that worked, but I think Joe Martin's out there was selling something odd out of the fields that uh, maybe gave him some extra revenue. But, um, but in any event, you know, I think, I think a municipality needs to be able to borrow money. Um, and, you know, the capacity limits are there out, set out by the province for a very specific reason, but we need to, because, you know, we can't, you can't, you can't go to the taxpayer when you need a $40 million arena and say, okay, it's time we're jacking it. We're doubling everyone's taxes for the next five years uh, to put in this arena. You need to be able to have the ability to spread that over time. Um, Cheryl, what are, and, and without getting into trouble with your boss on the line, but what are your thoughts on, <laughs> on uh, capital debt. Good question. <laughs> um, I think in some cases it is necessary, like you say, um, the city is looking at building a new recreation complex. Um, we don't have sufficient funding put away in reserves for that. It is a uh, 
needed within the community and we're hearing a lot of feedback from the community that that is a needed facility. So in that case, those types of cases, I think it's okay to issue debt to fund those types of expenses. Um, but I do tend to be more conservative and make sure that debt is only used for those types of circumstances mm -hmm. rather than just broadly used. I'd prefer to um, put money away and save for it and use reserves to fund ongoing asset management. Um, yeah. Yeah, and you know, and, and, and maybe that's something to think about. Do you have, you know, is there a capital expenditure limit that you say, you know, no, we, we, we will never borrow if the capital expenditure is below X. Um, we will always try and figure out a way to pay for that. Um, and maybe that's a wise and prudent to look at too from, uh, certainly from a CFO's perspective, because I, I understand you, your job is to balance absolutely everything and to make sure that we, you know, are an efficient um, uh, municipal government, uh, that we're not going into too much debt, uh, but financing um, or paying for things appropriately. That's, that's your job. You're, you're kind of like the person who's in charge at home of the finance, which I am not, by the way. Um, but um, that, that, that's what that person decides, whether they pay cash or whether they borrow and, uh, and what limits to set on that. So, you know, it's, it probably would help you in, in making a decision if you had some benchmarks or decisions that, you know, were more legislated and put into place and said, if, we, if it's a capital expenditure under $5 million, we never borrow. Um, we always find a way to pay for it or something. I don't know what the right number is, but something yeah, in I that think area. Having a good, a good debt policy in place is prudent and lo looking at, like you say, the, the dollar limits, the type of expenditures, and how that debt will be repaid in the future are all good components that yeah. need to be considered when um, looking at how you're gonna finance a project, whether it be from debt or other sources. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's really interesting. I know we're a little bit over time, but is, uh, I just wanna uh, get to a couple of quick questions here. Is there a way to get tax money from property being sold to the, gra to the greater Toronto area, if someone comes in from Toronto, purchase a house. Uh, th there was something said about that, wasn't there? There was, I think there was foreign investment. There were, there were I don't think it was extra property taxes. I think it was taxes to the federal government um, or provincial government, but um, but I don't think there is any, any, any ability to be able to tax. Well, that's the restriction that the province puts on municipalities, correct? Yeah, because I think as, as uh, uh, the author of that question notes, you know, it's capital gains and that's that's part of a tax regime that we don't have control over. If, if mm -hmm. that type of policy was to come in, it wouldn't be at the municipal level. Mm -hmm. um, but if it ever did and it was being generated from those types of sales, perhaps that's something a municipality would want to have a conversation with the uh, yeah. taxing power to say, hey, we should be getting a, sh a share of that back to the municipality. Yeah, um, yeah, there, there might yeah, be something. It's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, commentary. Just want to uh, quickly, too, I thought this was interesting. What is a year over year um, uh, infrastructure deficit? Um, at this point, I know we caught up a little bit there uh, a couple of years ago, but um, are are we are we now on pace with holding our own, or are we having a slight deficit every year uh, still? We still have a deficit every year, particularly in our roads. Um, I think we. Sh I don't have the exact figures in front of me, but um, I think we spend about. Three million dollars a year on um, infrastructure renewal of our roads, and it should be closer to five to seven million per year. Um, Yogesh is probably cringing. I see he's on the call. I don't know if I have those numbers exactly right, but we are still in a deficit, um, but we are addressing it and we are making headway. So over the years, we have improved, but there is still some way to go to catch up and make sure that we are keeping pace. Yeah. And yeah. Greg, that's not unique to the city of Cambridge. Every municipality is struggling with the infrastructure deficit in some way. So um, as, as Cheryl says, we are trying to address it and prioritize projects for council's consideration. Um, yeah. So yeah, we're, we're whittling away slowly. But it's to your point, we'll never problem. eliminate it. No, right? 
No, it, it's a coast to coast problem. And, you know, once you catch up and all of a sudden you're, you're falling behind again, it, it, it's a hard thing to deal with. Uh, technology, you know, might help as better piping in the grounds and lasts longer, that, that's going to help. But, uh, but it's going to take some time to get there. And, uh, and I think, you know, I'm, I'm glad we had this session. And I'm glad that, you know, uh, Cheryl, I'd love to communicate with you as I go through this uh, uh, brief from the Ontario Chamber to make sure that, that we get clarification in some areas as well, and maybe help guide the discussion uh, from their perspective to um, the provincial government uh, as well. I think every level of government above municipal governments need to pay attention to what's going on in our communities because our communities um, are really important to us. Uh, every single day, every single minute of every single day, they affect our life and our lifestyle. Um, it's um, uh, the most impact uh, of any government uh, that we have. I suppose one could argue about the broader, bigger, you know, global things, but uh, municipalities deal with every single part of our daily life, your street lights to your sidewalks, to your curbs and gutters, to your stormwater management, to your sewer and water. And, you know, it just goes on and on and on. And by the way, um, you can thank municipal levels of government for taking your trash away when you walk them out to the, to the curb every second week as well. So, you know, lots of things that we need municipal governments for. They're, they struggle every year with their budget. They hear from guys like me that say, no, 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 to an increase. Um, and, uh, and from lots of us, uh, because nobody likes to pay taxes. If we can help our municipal government find better funding mechanisms that don't impact us, that make property taxes and, uh, and, and their ability to tax us a little bit fair from our perspective. Um, I think everybody's on board with that. I know David and Cheryl certainly are, um, but they have to work within the confines of what they're given right now. And, uh, and I think if we all work together, we can find better ways of doing it. Because remember, they're property taxpayers too. So uh, uh, they, they've, they've got the exact same problem as all of us do. So. Thanks very much, Cheryl Ayers, the CFO from the City of Cambridge. Great to have you on for the first time. We're going to have you on more, and we'll leave David alone maybe a little bit. But Dave, <laughs> it's always great to, uh, to have a conversation with you too. And thanks very much for both of you for coming on this morning. A well, pleasure. Thanks yeah, for having me. Thank you. Okay, folks, have a great Wednesday. I'm sure we'll be talking to some of you later. Uh, <laughs> go have a great day. Be productive. And let's get things done. Thanks.